Everybody, this is David Robinson. I'm the Director of Membership and Meetings for the Linguistic Society of America. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon, and we're just going to wait a couple more minutes to allow uh, the rest of the attendees to log on, and then we'll get started. So uh, sit tight, and we'll be back with you in a couple of minutes. Okay, I think we're all here so we can get uh, started. Um, hello again, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on linguistics in the public sphere. I'm David Robinson, the Director of Membership and Meetings for the Linguistic Society of America, the LSA. Uh, you're watching right now a short presentation about the LSA and what we do, and if you're not already a member, you'll see a special discount membership offer for attendees of this webinar. Um, thanks again for taking the time out of your afternoon to join us. I'm happy to welcome the Executive Director of the Consortium of Social Science Associations, who will join LSA Executive Director Allison Reed for this basic overview of linguistic advocacy, including practical guidance on the most effective strategies for influencing public policy in today's political environment. Before we get started, I'd just like to take a moment to make sure you're familiar with the GoToWebinar dashboard that you'll see on your screen. Um, there are three uh, parts of it are, that are going to be the most important for you. Um, first, you'll see an audio widget on your GoToWebinar dashboard that will allow you to hear the audio portion of this webinar using your computer audio or by phone. And second, uh, we have some handouts that you're free to download at any time during the webinar. They include the PowerPoint presentation that you'll be seeing today, as well as some other resources you may find useful. Um, you'll find them in the little handouts widget on the webinar. Finally, the last part of this uh, webinar is going to be question and answer. Uh, and since there are so many of you uh, in attendance, your microphones are muted, and you'll be asking questions using the questions widget. Um, and uh, just please indicate when you write a question there, whether the question is for Wendy, for Allison, or for either one of them. And then lastly, before we get started, I'd like to take a couple of quick surveys so that our presenters have a better idea of who you are. I'll take about 30 seconds each, and uh, they'll ask you about your professional status and your experience with advocacy. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the first one here. Um, so you can go ahead and answer. And give it a couple more seconds. It looks like you have voted. Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll and I'm going to show the results to you. So uh, here are the results. Six of you are undergraduates, 12 or six percent. Twelve percent are graduate students. 71 are 71 percent are linguists in academia, and 12 percent in uh, linguists in industry or government. So I'm going to close that one, and then here is the other poll. This asks about your experience in linguistics advocacy. So here goes. Again, it'll only take about 30 seconds. OK, 
Okay, and it looks like just about all of you have voted, so I'm going to close it and share the results again with you. You'll see that um, it looks like about 80, almost 90 percent of you have uh, no or limited experience, so hopefully this will um, give you a good grounding in uh, how to get started. Um, all right. I that poll. Um, okay, and without further ado now, I'd like to turn the floor over to my colleague, Allison Reed, the Executive Director of the LS. Thank you, David. I appreciate uh, your organizing this webinar for us today, and I'm delighted to be here with my colleague, uh, Wendy Noss, from the uh, Consortium of Social Science Associations. I thought I could start by just uh, offering a quick overview of the agenda. So um, here it is. Um, so uh, we want to review the goals and the materials that we've provided for you. Um, we also want to talk about linguistics in the context of um, social science policy within the United States, and then uh, similarly, uh, linguistics within the context of humanities policy. Uh, then we'll move on uh, to talk about uh, linguistics research and the intersection with various kinds of substantive policies that relate to things like language and education and international relations and other substantive topics. Uh, and then we'll be talking about linguistics in the context of STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, and also higher education, uh, where the majority of say, members either uh, study or work. Um, the Q&A on policy issues will actually come at the end. Um, after we've done the role um, play as well as uh, the material that Wendy's going to cover on developing a relationship with your elected officials and their staff, um, more typically, uh, and how you can make the case for the value of linguistics, as well as um, the uh, types of communications uh, channels that you can use to influence your um, elected officials. Um, as I said, we'll do a role play. Uh, where uh, Wendy will uh, play the role of a congressional staffer, and I will play the role of the visiting constituent uh, who is trying to persuade the staffer uh, to support our uh, policy agenda. Um, and again, we'll take uh, questions and answers on anything that we've covered, um, and you can use the widget that uh, David uh, referenced earlier to submit your questions. So what are the goals of uh, this webinar? Uh, we want to equip you as linguists with the information tools you need to engage in effective advocacy on policy issues affecting both the field and the profession of linguistics. Um, we want to raise awareness among the policymakers through you about the value of linguistics research to advancing the national interest of the United States and any other countries. Um, that might be represented among the participants who are here today, um, but the focus will be primarily on U.S. policy. Um, we want to place linguistics within the broader context of the U.S. federal funding, um, agency funding for both STEM and the humanities. Uh, we want to engage linguists in forming and building relationships with members of the U.S. Congress and their staffs and other kinds of public officials um, to uh, generate continuing support of linguistics. Um, and then finally, we want to influence legislation and funding decisions made by Congress and other elected bodies in the current um, congressional session and uh, as it relates to uh, a number of fiscal years uh, that Wendy will be talking about uh, later in the presentation, um, but uh, at a minimum uh, fiscal year 2018 and 2019. Um, so those are the goals for the session, and I uh, just wanted to refer you briefly to some of the resource materials that are available to you um, and I think have been uh, shared with you already uh, via the webinar uh, software and or uh, an email that you got from David. Um, but we have uh, a wonderful fact sheet um, that we use uh, at the staff level whenever we make uh, visits to congressional offices, and this is our issue brief on uh, language in the humanities and language in science, and it provides an excellent pithy uh, overview uh, about what is linguistics and how is linguistics relevant to um, the national interest 
economic uh, security and other kinds of, um, I should have said economic competitiveness and national security um, and other issues that uh, elected officials tend to care about like education. Um, and then uh, the suite of policy resources that you can find uh, on the LSA's website uh, under the heading of public policy. Um, we have a number of sub pages uh, linked there that um, describe all of what I'm going to present in um, considerable detail. So uh, please take a look at those when you have an opportunity uh, and uh, we update, update those regularly. So um, look for more information as time goes on. Uh, and then there are some uh, resources available from COSA, um, which Wendy will uh, cover during her talk, um, but those are available on their website. And then um, the National Humanities Alliance, that's what NHA stands for, um, is one of our key partners on um, linguistics advocacy, and they have a tool on their website where you can find any grants that have been made by the NEH to um, entities within your state, um, universities, colleges, other kinds of um, institutions that are eligible for funding. And that can be very helpful. Even if you don't have your own uh, NEH grant, you can say, the NEH has contributed this amount of money for humanities research in my home state or in this congressional district. And that can be a powerful argument, even if there hasn't been specific funding for linguistics, for example, uh, in, in a recent year. Um, and then they also have an advocacy guide um, and uh, they're actually having their uh, big national conference uh, and lobby day on Monday and Tuesday. So I will be there along with uh, Catherine Davies, who is uh, the chair of the English department at the University of Alabama. Um, and so we'll be talking about uh, linguistics in the context of the humanities. Uh, but today we're focusing more on the social science side of thing because uh, we have my excellent co-presenter, Wendy Naus, to help us navigate that. Um, so now I'm going to get into the meat of the um, presentation, which is to talk about linguistics in the public sphere. Um, and I first like to talk about the primary sources of U.S. federal funding for linguistics research. Um, so the National Science Foundation is the main source of public funding for linguistics research in the United States. And that funding um, in the National Science Foundation, um, the biggest of those is SBE Directorate. Now, SBE stands for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences. And that's where the linguistics program is housed, along with anthropology and political science and um, many of our uh, social science peer um, disciplines and fields of inquiry. In addition to the linguistics program, which is sort of the theoretical and basic research um, program for linguistics, there's also um, the Documenting Endangered Languages program, DEL, uh, which is jointly funded uh, by the NSF and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And um, that program, it provides support for linguists who are doing documentation, presentation um, work in endangered languages. Um, and then finally, uh, there are cross-disciplinary and other directorates within NSF that have um, a logical connection to language and linguistics. So for example, um, the Computer Science Directorate, um, which I think has a fancier name, um, but uh, former LSA uh, president Terry Langenden is a consultant to that directorate and um, there are other um, uh, aid, I'm sorry, offices within the NSF that um, have in, an interest in the scientific study of language and um, so you'll sometimes uh, hear about funding opportunities from, from those um, directorates as well. Um, the second largest source of funding for linguistics research is the National Endowment for the Humanities. And um, they fund both um, theoretical and basic scholarly research in linguistics, but they also, as I just mentioned, jointly support the DEL program. Um, after that, uh, the biggest source of federal funding for linguistics research um, 
is probably the National Institutes of Health, but it's scattered. Um, so there isn't one um, institute within NIH that is dedicated to language or um, linguistics. So um, there are uh, institutes there that have to do with deafness, that have to do with child development, that have to do with mental health, um, that have to do with neuroscience, you know, that have to do with a lot of um, issues that linguistic research can help to inform in terms of health and well-being. Um, so uh, we definitely um, advocate for um, healthy funding levels for NIH, and in particular, they have an office of behavioral and um, Thank Social Sciences, OBSSR, and the R is for research. Thank you, Wendy, um, who's uh, helping me remember what all these initials stand for um, from the side. And I probably misspoke um, when I said that NIH was probably the third biggest source of funding for linguistics research, because actually, I think it's this next bullet that probably um, provides uh, the greatest amount of funding after um, the NSF, really, um, but also scattered uh, at a couple of different agencies. So language-related research supported by the Departments of Defense, State, the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Administration, and DARPA, um, which I can't even remember what that stands for, but it's basically the Defense Research something something. And uh, they have for decades uh, funded linguistic research, foundational linguistic research, basic linguistic research that has helped to keep the nation secure um, and represented our uh, diplomatic interests and foreign relations and international relations um, interests. Uh, and then there are some small pots of money from these next two agencies. So the Smithsonian Institution, there are linguists working there doing research on the connection between language and culture. Um, and at the National Archives, there are significant repositories of um, language dictionaries and other grammars and other kinds of um, linguistic source materials that are from um, the United States uh, indigenous uh, communities. And then finally, the Administration for Native Americans, uh, which is housed within the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. That's what HHS stands for. Um, and they administer a number of educational programs and community-based programs for tribal communities to um, help uh, with language revitalization as well as preservation. Um, so that's uh, something that I'm going to talk about a little bit more when we uh, discuss pending legislation in Congress. Um, so let me move to my next slide. So here's a little bit more detail about NSF, and I've probably already mentioned um, some of this, but some important things to know about um, the linguistics program within the larger context of the National Science Foundation is that we are part of this directorate. And in fact, um, this particular directorate, because it's new um, and because it represents social science, um, has become a frequent target for critics, uh, 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 mainly conservative Republicans, um, who have argued for either its consolidation, its elimination, or um, significant reductions in funding levels um, because uh, they don't see the value of social science research for issues like economic competitiveness or national security. And that's where we come in and show them how linguistics is valuable in both regards. Um, so the fate of the funding for the linguistics program at NSF rises and falls within this larger boat of um, the SBE directorate. And Wendy's gonna talk uh, more about uh, what's happening currently uh, with the Trump administration's budget proposals for fiscal year 19, as well as what's happened recently um, with previous uh, fiscal year um, proposals that are actually still pending in Congress. Um, so the head of the directorate uh, for SBE rotates every five years. And I'm pleased to say that we recently had someone in charge who was a linguist. That was uh, David Lightfoot, um, who is now back at Georgetown University. So they rotate in and out. Um, but that, I think, was an important uh, 
point of visibility for linguistics within the NSF and built a lot of bridges um, with other disciplines and other um, directorates within the institution. And so I think that was very powerful. Um, and then uh, be, because the depart, excuse me, because the Documenting Endangered Languages program is jointly funded with NEH, NEH it's even more vulnerable to budget cuts than other NSF programs. And it, it's vulnerable because um, funding for the National Endowment for the Humanities is probably a fraction of about, I don't know, one or two percent of the budget of NSF. Um, and so uh, willingness of Congress to make investments in the humanities versus the hard sciences um, or uh, the social sciences when they fall under the heading of um, the, the STEM um, rubric um, is, is much more generous. So Congress likes science more than they like the humanities is the, the short way of saying that. And in fact, some um, leaders within the National Science Foundation have questioned whether the documenting endangered languages program is sufficiently scientific in nature um, because it's mostly uh, focused on a descriptive aspect of linguistic uh, research and have wondered if it's truly scientific. Um, in addition to that, um, we have heard uh, informally from uh, colleagues that work within the Education and Human Resources Directorate that they do not view social science and linguistics in particular as a STEM field that would fit under the heading of STEM education. So um, there are lots of national conversations about ways to improve STEM education at the K through 12 education levels as well as at the undergraduate levels. and. Um, it's not unusual for social science fields and linguistics to be excluded from those definitions of STEM, um, not only when you're uh, talking about K-12, where we have admittedly a limited presence, but even um, at the higher levels of education. And that comes up, for example, um, there's a visa waiver program that uh, grants visas to um, students pursuing PhDs in high demand STEM fields. And um, we've had ongoing conversations with um, various agencies about how the STEM fields are defined and whether or not those would include the social sciences um, and linguistics being part of that. So that's something uh, we're keeping an eye on and is part of our ongoing agenda. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more about the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, here. Um, so as I said, it's jointly funded with NSF. Um, it averages about 38 awards per year um, for 80 applications um, over the past five years. Um, but they also fund sort of the traditional um, theoretical and basic scholarly linguistics research. That's a separate program that you can apply for um, and that we argue for continued funding of. Um, and then there are other um, funding streams within NEH that might um, incorporate some linguistic elements. So those might be anthropology. They might be something around a specific foreign language um, that has a linguistic component. And the long-term trend in funding um, for NEH has been reductions under the Obama administration, under the Bush administration. Um, it's been uh, a 20% decline since uh, 2010. Um, it's been targeted by some Republicans in recent years for complete elimination. And that's actually part of the uh, RNC's official platform. Uh, and this year is no different. So uh, for the second year in a row, the Trump administration has called for the complete elimination of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And so uh, clearly that's something we strongly oppose. Uh, we'll be talking about that on Monday and Tuesday, as I mentioned, when we're up on Capitol Hill. Um, and we welcome your involvement in uh, letter writing and communications to Congress to, to fight that. And the good news there is that um, there are other Republicans and many Democrats who actually support the NEH and believe that there is a role for the federal government in supporting humanities research. 
and public engagement in humanities programs. And so um, the Trump administration has not been successful in eliminating funding for the NEH, but um, it's not over until a rotund person sings at the opera. And so uh, we'll see what happens uh, in the current fiscal year. Um, so again, our focus has been on both the um, Congress and the executive branch pro uh, fighting proposed cuts. And then I just wanted to briefly mention a few other programs that uh, we are interested in supporting that relate to linguistics and the humanities. So um, the international education programs, the Fulbright Hayes and Title programs have been targeted for a 71% cut. Uh, in tr uh, Trump's fiscal year 19 budget. Um, there are more details about that on our website, but clearly that would be a crippling blow to that program, and we're very concerned about that. Um, and then we continue to um, be supportive of robust funding for the National Archives, the Congress, and the Smithsonian, which all have um, small um, elements of linguistic resources, linguistics research, et cetera. So now I'd like to turn um, to uh, a, a more uh, promising area of um, policy, and that's federal support for Native American language revitalization. So there's actually some good news here, and um, I'm not going to read through um, this slide. I'll um, leave it for you to digest um, as you have more time, but in essence, um, the uh, main vehicle for um, Native American language revitalization is this Esther Martinez um, program. And the reauthorization of that um, has been taken up in the United States Senate uh, last year and was approved unanimously. So strong bipartisan support, as you know, the Republicans control the Senate and the House. Um, it has been referred to um, the House uh, Committee of Jurisdiction, which is the Education and Workforce Committee. And so we're particularly interested in contacting the members of Congress that serve on that committee and asking if they would co-sponsor the legislation, if they would pressure the chair of the committee to bring it up for a vote and um, refer it to the House as a, a whole uh, for, for a full vote and um, I think it's one of the few um, bright spots in what is uh, the small uh, policy, many of the issues that we care about. And so this is a real opportunity for the LSA membership to really get involved in advancing something that could have a very positive um, in a very so do a look for more um, covers the funding streams that we are interested in as linguists and uh, now I'm going to turn my attention to sort of the substantive issues where um, linguistics can um, linguistics research can help to inform public policy so what do we know as a result of all of the work that the LSA membership has done over the many decades of our society, enhanced human, so uh, certainly um, we have a role to play in higher education, in immigration, in the research enterprise, international relations, foreign language study and research, um, the STEM uh, field, as I mentioned uh, when I was uh, speaking in my previous slide, that social science gets left out of STEM. Um, and then uh, sometimes within the field of linguistics and the linguistics community itself, there are disagreements about whether or not uh, linguistics is a cognitive science, a social science, a humanistic uh, field of inquiry, or some hybrid blending of, of all of those or um, additional thoughts that people have about it. And so um, there's, there's no consensus. I think that 
we um, that um, enhance support for linguistics and uh, we're very happy to be classified as a humanistic discipline uh, for that purpose as well. So um, uh, we're very consensus oriented and um, uh, oh, wide tent uh, when it comes to that question. Um, so uh, within higher education, there's a whole range of, of funding and regulatory issues that we concern ourselves to make sure that uh, the contribution of um, higher education to the nation's well-being are valued and appreciated because uh, I think you've probably seen recent opinion polls showing that people's trust institution of higher education is eroding and um, things are becoming much more polarized in terms of people's attitudes about the role of higher education um, and support for higher education um, and certainly for state universities um, that problem is acute. Um, in addition to that, the immigration policies, um, so the Trump travel ban and other uh, immigration policies have restricted the um, mobility of international scholars, including linguists who you know, would love to the United States um, and come to our research conferences. And um, we would like to be able to send our um, linguistic students who may be from other countries. Um, we would like them to have mobility so that if they want to attend a conference in Canada or elsewhere, they don't have to worry about whether or not they can even make it back into the United States to con continue their studies at their home institution that they um, have their visa for. Um, so that's been a continuing area of interest for us. Um, we get involved in work on uh, federal policies relating to the research enterprise as a whole. So you may have heard that there were efforts to uh, conduct a comprehensive overhaul of the federal regulations governing human subjects research. And uh, we had a linguist working at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy under the Obama administration, Phil Rubin, who did a lot of work on that. And um, we think that the new regulations were actually going to be a positive development for linguists and other social scientists. And unfortunately, those regulations have been uh, postponed um, for at least a year, Wendy, um, and possibly longer. Uh, and so we're very disappointed about that. We know that linguists have a challenging time negotiating with institutional review boards over their research. And there's a lack of understanding uh, within IRBs about how the language is being studied, which are, are of course, uh, spoken um, or communicated by human beings. Um, how that differs from conducting clinical research on human subjects. Um, so that's a continuing uh, challenge for all of us from a policy standpoint, as well as an institutional standpoint. Um, international relations, uh, we know that uh, diplomacy and um, foreign policy are dependent on um, our leaders and our diplomats having a grounding in language and that linguistics research has many applications in um, domestic security and um, national security. And so um, that's something where we um, advocate for continued f support and um, engagement uh, by linguists and others in international relations work. And then finally, uh, foreign language study and research. So we, we continue to advocate for that, uh, mainly through our partnership with um, other organizations that represent foreign language teachers and um, students who are studying foreign languages. So, um, this is uh, just to provide a little bit more detail on um, the primary areas of public policy that are influenced by linguistics research. So K-12 education, um, both STEM education, which I've already talked about, but um, all of the work that's done uh, around language acquisition um, for both English language learners as well as bilingual education and foreign language instruction overall. Um, teacher training and pedagogy, how teachers can be most effective at helping students acquire a second language um, more readily. 
we are also involved in um, informing policies around native language immersion and revitalization. So there are things that work and things that don't work so well when it comes to native language immersion and revitalization. And linguistic research has helped to inform the most effective policies relating to um, those kinds of programs. Um, higher education, again, I've talked about the role of international ed and foreign language scholarship. Um, we've also taken a strong stand in opposition to uh, laws uh, trying to establish English as the official or only language of states and um, the United States federal um, government as well, and we've been successful in that regard. And then finally, we're also active uh, in the sphere of human rights and criminal justice because there are language issues relating to interpreters um, for uh, people who are uh, being interrogated by uh, uh, either the police officers or the a court system, and um, they're being questioned in a language they don't understand. Um, but there are also uh, issues of dialect discrimination against witnesses and um, defendants um, who um, are not uh, understood by juries because of their accent or their dialect. And um, many of you have probably uh, heard John Rickford, our LSA president's um, address a few years ago that talked extensively about the Trayvon Martin case and how um, linguistic discrimination um, affected the outcome of that case. Um, so just a, a brief word about our policy partner. So Wendy um, is with the consortium and she's gonna tell you more about the work they're doing. As I said, uh, on Monday and Tuesday, we'll be with the National Humanities Alliance. I serve on their board um, until uh, about a month ago when my term concluded. Um, and then uh, we have these other four organizations that we work with quite closely. So the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the publisher of the journal Science, uh, and they sort of serve as an umbrella organization for all of the science advocacy work that goes on here in Washington. Uh, we're also involved with an organization called the Joint National Committee on Language. They just had Language Advocacy Day a few weeks ago, and I was up on Capitol Hill participating with them uh, on that event. Um, the Coalition for National Science Fund Funding um, is one of our partners, and this um, organization represents a lot of the scholarly societies that um, have uh, directorates or funding streams um, available to them within NSF. Uh, but it also includes a lot of university government relations officers uh, for the major research universities uh, throughout the United States. And so this is um, an important collaborative um, coalition that we work with. And then finally, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages is also very active um, on federal language policy issues. So uh, that concludes my presentation, and um, I'm happy to take questions at the end, but if you have them now, you can start typing them in. If there's anything I've said that wasn't um, entirely clear, please do uh, let me know. And now I'm happy to have Wendy come on board. Okay, bear with, with us as we transition here. Hi, all. Good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you all today and to um, dig in a little bit more on uh, federal policy as it relates to social and behavioral science research and linguistics in particular. Um, so as Allison said, I'm uh, Wendy Noss, Executive Director of the Consortium of Social Science Associations here in Washington, DC. Um, and we are an umbrella organization um, and you can see our governing associations shown by the logos on the screen here. Um, we, uh, our primary function is advocacy, so we exist to lobby the Congress uh, and federal agencies in the White House in support of funding and policy for social and behavioral science research. Um, and so we um, do that through our members. Um, we do it directly. Our staff are registered lobbyists, but we also work very closely with our member organizations, such as the LSA, um, uh, in, in uh, spreading 
uh, uh, the word about uh, the importance of, of linguistics research and social and behavioral science research um, more generally um, to increase funding for uh, the programs that Allison outlined, um, but as well as to um, encourage the use of social science in policymaking itself to make sure that policies are in fact based on evidence. Um, and the LSA has been uh, a member since our founding in 1981. In addition to our, our governing members, though, and I, I know this text is, is small, um, but uh, to show that we have about 100 other organizations as well who are affiliates of COSA. And so if you see your institution, there's about 50 universities. If you see your institution on the list there, um, you uh, may already be receiving our materials directly through your university. But as a member of the LSA, you are entitled to our, our materials and our activities. And so I hope that you will sign up for those. Okay, um, but let's first um, talk about the political context and why we do what we do at COSA and why your participation in advocacy is so critical. Um, so it's probably not a surprise uh, to hear that science, especially social and behavioral science, has had a checkered past when it comes to support from policymakers. But um, it's important to remember that at our country's founding, scientific research was seen as a fundamental function of our government. So Article I of the Constitution states that Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science. Um, and so this passage is often overlooked when people invoke the Constitution, but um, I think it's important to remember that, that the, the function of research, federally supported research in particular, um, was at the founding of our country. Um, but where are we today? The, the challenges of the current political moment are not limited to social science, um, so it should not be, or science in general, I suppose. <laughs> um, but it should not be a shock to anyone that science is not a centerpiece of the current White House. Um, and this is even more stark, I think, when you look at where we were with the Obama administration that put science front and center. Um, in fact, President Obama actually, uh, among his first appointments um, when he took office, were his science advisor, uh, the secretary for the Department of Energy, and the, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA administrator. By comparison, um, you know, President Trump has not app appointed a science advisor. Um, and actually, at this point, we're, we're thinking that he probably will not. It's just not a function that he sees running out of the White House, unfortunately. Um, but another macro challenge to science is that Congress is still log jammed, even though the same party is in control. Um, and this is due to party infighting. In fact, um, I predict that um, even less will be accomplished uh, over the next couple of years than when Congress and the White House were of different political parties. Um, it's just that bad right now, and it shows, um, I think, how the party infighting um, really has gotten to a level that has um, stymied progress in, in so many ways. Um, another broader challenge is that applied research tends to be valued over basic research, and this this is, this is tough for um, communities who care about basic research funded by the National Science Foundation, for example. Um, and this isn't because necessarily there is anything um, against basic science on the Hill. It's, it's more a lack of general understanding of what basic research is and what the peer review process is. But of course, in addition, the nature of the work of members of Congress prevents policymakers from thinking long term. So this is because, you know, in the House, there are two year terms. So that means that members of Congress are constantly running for reelection and under pressure to deliver for their constituencies. Um, but also we have an annual budgeting process, which makes it nearly impossible um, for policymakers to make investments long term. And when we talk about um, uh, basic research, we're talking about long term investment. And our structure is just not set up in a way um, to allow um, for those types of investments to happen easily. So if those are some of the challenges to the science enterprise writ large, um, certainly there are some challenges specific to the, the social science community, and Allison alluded to some of those. 
Um, but for example, you know, these are sort of generalizations and it's not just for the linguistic community, but social science in general and the types of things that COSA um, works against um, most days. So many people, including policymakers, think that they already understand what social science is. It's the sort of my grandmother told me that problem. Why is this scientific? Why do we actually need to study this? Or where policymakers are coming from, why do we need to spend taxpayer dollars on this? It's not necessarily that that certain policymakers do not support the science itself, it's that they don't see it as a function of the federal government to fund it. Um, common sense is something we hear all the time. Well, this is a common sense finding. Why do we need to study it? Not re realizing that at one point it probably wasn't common sense, um, and it may be now, thanks to, um, thanks to science that has backed it up. And then this idea of fear reflection, um, that some social science fields can shed light on the human condition especially true in, in psychology um, or sociology. Um, and uh, uh, we don't always wanna know what the findings are. It hits a little too close to home sometimes. Political science uh, as a discipline is often quite um, uh, uh, criticized on the Hill because as you can imagine, members of Congress um, feel like they understand political science and politics. And so it, it, hits, it strikes a chord, unfortunately, with them. Okay. Um, in addition, though, um, and this is generalizing as well, but social science challenges um, tend to fall into three buckets. And Allison mentioned them slightly, and I'm not going to go into detail. But if we're seeing a member of Congress be critical of social and behavioral science or linguistics research, it's happening in one of three ways by funding. So funding, in, um, funding cuts to an entire agency um, or targeting specific programs for cuts. It'll be happening through policy, um, so policy riders or um, non-funding bills that direct an agency to do something. Um, sometimes that language can be um, against the best interest of social science research or a science agency. Or negative and misleading statements, which don't necessarily mean legislation, um, but envision a member of Congress going to the House or Senate floor and saying something derogatory about um, about social science or linguistics research and how it's not really scientific. Number three is especially true um, when dealing with other cultures and populations outside the U.S. And so that's when your community, I think, would see the challenges play out uh, uh, more regularly. OK, but all that said, there are still reasons to be optimistic. So first, social science is not under under a direct attack by those who matter. And I should say, you know, if you were to read these slides as they are, you would think that um, the entire Congress is against social and behavioral science, when in fact, it's just a handful of members in the House and the, in, in the Senate. Um, in most cases, policymakers don't really care <laughs> about social science one way or the other. It's just not an issue for them. So they're not trying to um, attack it directly by funding or, or by other means. So yes, there are critics out there, um, but they don't currently sit in positions that have a lot of influence. Um, the one, uh, say, outlier there is in the case of the um, member of Congress who chairs the House Science Committee, who has been quite outspoken um, about his um, critiques of, of social and behavioral science, especially funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, but uh, he has been marginalized in a lot of ways. He doesn't have much of an audience with appropriations um, committees, but also he's retiring. So even though this sounds pretty bad, um, the, the active attacks are quite few. This is, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. So on the one hand, policymakers aren't focusing on us and they don't care about smaller ticket items um, like social science funding. The amount of funding that social science gets across the government is a rounding error compared to other parts of the budget. So, in a lot of ways, we can just sort of fly under the radar screen. The downside of that, of course, means if you're not big and flashy and have a lot of spotlight on you, you can't expect for new money to come um, for your research, at least for the foreseeable future. So unfortunately, what we're faced with is um, a, a bit of a zero sum game when it comes to funding for social science for the next couple of years. Um, another reason to be optimistic, though, is that um, there are tight margins. Uh, as, as I'm sure you know, um, in uh, the House and the Senate between the Republicans and the Dem Democrats. And so this um, forces um, compromise among the parties. And that, that's, that symbol 
uh, of the thumbs down. That's my John McCain thumb <laughs> um, for those of you who followed the healthcare debate, um, just to show that you never know what's going to happen when the margins are really, really tight and it forces uh, the parties to actually work together. My, my most important point though here, and the most important reason to be optimistic um, is that Congress holds the power of the purse, period. Um, they dispense the money. So, um, you know, the Trump budget uh, that Allison alluded to earlier, and I'll go into more detail, is really not based in reality. And um, and further, Congress, even though is the Congress is currently of the same party um, as, as the White House, um, they don't agree with Trump's uh, proposals for spending um, in, included in the budget request. And so that's a good thing. And that means our focus needs to be on the Congress, where we know we have champions for science, um, and where we know um, uh, the difference can be made in terms of, um, if not increasing budgets, at least keeping programs whole and keeping agencies whole. So when we're in an environment like this, where it seems like everything is on the table, um, especially considering where we were two years ago in the last administration, where the dynamics were much different, how do we actually advocate um, and what do we, what do, we do? Um, as I said earlier, social science funding is so small, given the sort of the bigger issues at play. Um, and so our advocacy strategy, at least for the, the next couple of years, is to stick with our partners in the discretionary um, side of the budget. So what that means is um, the federal budget is, is um, divided into mandatory and discretionary. So think entitlements and then everything else. And then discretionary is further broken down into defense and non-defense. So where research lies is non-defense discretionary spending. Um, so what that means is in an environment like this, where it's a zero sum game, um, and we have a White House that very much wants to make investments in defense at the expense of everything else, it's a contingent upon the entire non-defense community to stick together and make sure that funding overall um, remains robust. And then we can worry about what science funding is within that later. Um, but priority number one is making sure that defense doesn't take all the funding away from non-defense. And that's all that's meant on, um, on this slide here. So let's talk about funding um, in a little bit more detail. So um, fiscal year 2018 started on October 1st of last year, which means we are almost six months into the current fiscal year, um, but we don't have a budget for that for that fiscal year. Um, so right now we are currently operating under the fourth continuing resolution or stopgap spending measure. Um, and there have been two government shutdowns, although brief so far, um, and we're facing another one on March 23rd if there is no final resolution on the budget this year. Um, the good news is that uh, last month there was a two year deal uh, made for raising the spending caps. So think of it like your household budget. Um, you know how much you make, you know how much you spend on certain things, but you're really waiting for a raise. And say uh, you finally get a raise and your paycheck is going to be a little bit higher. Now you need to decide where to spread that extra money. Um, and that's basically what the spending caps deal did. So if you look at before there was a deal, um, uh, and the spending caps were quite low, tamping down spending on everything. Um, this is where uh, the House and the Senate wanted to make their investments. Um, you can see that um, in most cases, the budgets for science agencies, which is what's mostly shown here, um, were uh, essentially flat with the enacted 2017 level. So House and Senate were going for flat. Um, but, and I would say there's one exception, which is NSF down there at the bottom, which both the House and the Senate we're, um, we're seeking cuts to NSF, which was problematic. Um, but now that we have a budget deal um, and the caps have been raised, and so the household budget is now higher, um, appropriators are trying to figure out how to spread that extra money across these agencies. So the numbers you see on the screen here are not going to be the final say um, for these agencies. And so advocates like, like us and like the LSA and others um, are working right now to make sure that the the additional money for 2018 is going to be spread to um, to the science agencies to make sure that the agencies stay whole for the fiscal year that we're currently in. So the bottom line here is that flat funding, um, flat is the new up, as I like to say, for research funding. Um, if you reframe your thinking about um, 
science funding um, uh, and, and not, not um, sort of requiring that we have substantial annual increases every year, it won't seem so bad, flat as the new up. Um, but Allison also talked about how there are multiple budgets in play. Um, so in addition to 2018, sort of hopefully getting wrapped up by, by um, in the next two weeks or so, uh, the president recently released his budget request for 2019, um, which begins October of this year. Um, so last month his budget request came out and it, you know, similar to last year was bad for lots of reasons, um, but particularly bad for research agencies. Um, what's really troubling about the budget is that it ignores this idea of um, uh, parity between non-defense and defense spending. So it seeks, once again, to use non-defense, so housing, research, police, um, all sort of non-defense related discretionary spending, using that chunk of money as the bank for defense investments. And that's something, again, as I said earlier, with sort of being creative with our partnerships and working with the broader discretionary community, um, trying to combat that, make sure that doesn't happen. But as I said earlier, um, Congress holds the power of the purse and Congress is, is not supportive of the president's request for, um, uh, for science agencies in particular. Um, so this is just a snapshot of what the administration is proposing for 2019. Um, NSF, uh, uh, the administration is proposing flat funding and for um, NEH, you can see the sizable decrease there as proposed. But again, non-starter with the Congress. There are um, champions for these and other agencies on the Hill. So I don't want to scare you too much about this. Um, but just to say a specific word about NSF. So even though the budget request is flat for NSO NSF overall, as Allison was noting earlier, um, the Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences Directorate is, is slated for a disproportionate cut of 9.1%. And actually, um, it's closer to uh, 11 or 12 percent to SBE research activities. Um, so that's problematic, obviously. Uh, and so one action that you could take as an advocate for linguistic scholarship is to tell Congress to reject these proposed cuts to SBE. Um, and we'll be issuing an action alert soon that the LSA is always very good about, um, about sharing and promoting with its members. This will be a major sort of grassroots action this year to make sure that NSF continues to fund all fields of science um, and that not one area of science or one directorate is impacted um, disproportionately from the others. So that is the broad context. So you're probably thinking at this point, um, what can I do? The, the news seems um, mixed at best, if not terrible at times for some, <laughs> for some things. Um, so I'm going to finish up with um, uh, some quick slides about types of things that you can do as an advocate. Um, so we all know that the First Amendment uh, uh, to, to the Constitution provides for freedom of religion and speech and press and assembly. But we hear much less often about the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So to make your opinions known to elected officials have, is a function that has actually been written into our founding documents, but it's really not exercised by many. Um, so in short, at COSA, we define successful advocacy as achieving the perfect combination of getting the right information to the right audiences at the right time. Um, and by the way, it has to be short, meaning it has to fit on one sheet of paper or one page. Brevity and gold really, brevity um, is really gold in, in DC. Uh, it's not a dig on policymakers, um, but most of them would actually agree with you. Policymakers would agree with you that they don't think they're the experts on science. And so they're looking for the experts to tell them what to do. And that's um, you know priority number one when it comes to um, getting engaged in advocacy is to serve that expert role. So contrary to, to, to what most people think, Congress actually does value um, their constituents' input. They rely um, on constituents' views to shape their opinions. They're there to represent you after all. It may not feel like it all the time, um, but most of the decisions that they make are not these sort of big, huge policy decisions that you hear about on CNN, or immigration and healthcare reform. They're small issues and small tweaks around the edges of lawmaking. Um, and they those are the the, the points where they need experts that they can rely on to help them make these decisions. 
They genuinely want to understand what impacts you as a constituent, um, and they want evidence um, to help them make a policy decision that will deliver for their state or for their district. And they view constituents, and in their minds, a constituent is a voter. Um, that's how you're seen. Uh, they get priority treatment in their eyes. So I can go in as a registered lobbyist and advocate for linguistics research or other social and behavioral science research as much as I want, um, but coming from you as a constituent, i.e. a voter, is way more impactful. So what will set your communications apart um, from the hundreds of other communications that a member of Congress may receive in a given day is paying attention to the quality of your interactions. We see there being really three goals when it comes to strengthening the quality of your communications with policymakers. Um, you want to know your audience, you want to take them on a journey with your message, and then you want to give them your message or the information in a format that they can use. So first we want our messages to, to be set apart from other voices, um, and we want members of Congress to care about our issue. You cannot um, uh, expect to um, change a member of Congress's beliefs. Um, but what you can do is make them care enough um, by, knowing, by knowing what it is that they care about um, as an individual. So uh, what do members care about? They care about getting reelected. This is how members of Congress, um, this is how their jobs are evaluated. They care about what's happening in their constituency. Everything for them is local. And then they have their values and beliefs, which overlay everything that they do. Um, it's, it's unrealistic to think that science and facts can override any of these motivations, that if they just understood the science, they would change their value or their belief. Um, most people, you and I, um, we don't like to be told what to do, but we can be more welcoming um, to receiving information to help us make informed decisions. So if you change your delivery from, I'm going to tell you something, um, give you the facts and you're going to change your belief instead of making it more, um, let me give you information to assist you in making a, an informed decision. You'll get more mileage out of this relationship. So from where lawmakers sit or even their staff, um, science can be seen as just another player with an ax to grind. I mean, you're there asking for something um, and they're expecting you to ask for something. Um, science can bump again, up against their ideology and religion. As I said earlier, sometimes it's uncomfortable knowing what some of these findings are because it's, it, it hits too close to home. But what they really want from, uh, from their constituents and from advocates is uh, trust, approachability, understanding of their issues and their interests, mutual respect and proactivity. Um, taking them on a journey with your communication. Because science can sometimes be in conflict with ideology or beliefs, you have to give them a reason to care. And that reason, more times than not, is making it local. Policymakers, they may not know the science, um, they may not know uh, your side of an issue, but what they do know is what their constituents are calling about. So um, as much as you can tie what it is that you do to local issues, um, the better off you'll be. I, I recognize that's not always possible um, with all areas of research, especially basic research, but use it as an exercise to think sort of more globally about the work that you do and whether there can be any connections made to policy making on the local level. They want their constituents to answer a couple of questions. What exactly do they want me to do? That's clarity. Um, context. Why are my constituents raising this? What is the local context? What are the current or um, potential local impacts? They want relevance, not only the context on the ground, um, but similar to context. How exactly is this going to affect the citizens? Why is it relevant to me? And justification. How can um, I describe this issue to my colleagues in the Congress to get them to vote as well? Say I agree with you. What's the justification for me to take any action on it? And then lastly, um, giving, it in, uh, giving them the information in a format that they can use. Policymakers are looking for you to tell them exactly what you want them to do for you. So make their action step as simple as possible. Um, whether you're making a call or sending an email through an action alert system or you're meeting in person, you want to lead with your ask, you want to keep your message short and relatable, um, and you want to give them something very specific to do. Now, I know your tendency as a researcher 
um, maybe to provide all of the evidence that you can and um, to support your argument. Um, but with a policy audience, it's more about persuasion um, and, and less is more. So instead you wanna focus on piquing their interest um, using the devices that I mentioned earlier. So I wanted to end with a few practical tips for advocating specifically um, for social science and linguistics research. Generally speaking, um, we encourage advocates for social science to focus on three goals, regardless of what your specific ask is. So maybe you're, um, you, you've been sent an action alert and it's related to SBE funding because it's cut right now in the budget request. Um, regardless, um, we generally keep three goals in the back of our pocket when we go and, and speak with policymakers. To advocate in support of funding for research and sound science policies, just generally, support for research is good. Um, to inform policymakers and their staff about the value of linguistics research and the critical role of federal support. And that's the point um, I want to emphasize there. As I said earlier, policymakers may, may support the research itself, but it's a question of if it's worth taxpayer, i.e. federal support. And then third, to become a resource for elected officials. Um, there's a lot of ways you, you can get involved. Um, think of it as a menu of options. So there's likely an avenue that will fit with what you are able to do given your time constraints or resources constraints. Um, perhaps it's writing a letter, it's coming to DC, it's sending an email, etc. cetera. Um, each have their merits, each have their limitations, but they're all part uh, of a process and, and all of them are worth pursuing. The real point here is to make sure that you are engaging and not just once. Um, advocacy is a commitment of time um, and sending one email one time likely won't be enough. Um, and I think part of the purpose of this webinar and the resources that the LSA is providing is to get you involved in this process and to make you part of the process, um, not just one time. So becoming a resource to them, like I said earlier, um, it, it, so that they can reach out to you when they need evidence to guide a policy decision or they just need to bounce an idea off of you, that will pay major dividends down the road, but it's a commitment of time. And I cannot stress this enough when it comes time to engage, um, <clears throat> keep it simple. So your job is to make the case from where you sit for why linguistics and therefore social science research more generally is in the national interest um, and why you should be considered a resource to the policymaker. Don't be intimidated. It is not your job to be an expert on the federal agencies or programs or funding levels that Allison and I outlined. That's our job to understand that stuff. You're there to talk about what you do and what you know. Um, you should use your own words and stories. You should not be intimidated by using wonky policy or legal terms. That's just a um, uh, very common angst that I hear when I do training of folks going and communicating with policymakers. So we've thrown a lot of information at you um, and you might be wondering how to make sense uh, of, all that, of all of this and what you can actually do. And so here are three things that you could do right now. Um, one is to get active with the LSA and your other professional societies. Chances are, as you heard from Allison, um, chances are um, other organizations have alerts and materials and policy briefs and things that you can pull down easily and use in your communication or make sure that you're signing up to receive these materials directly so that when there is a dire need for your grassroots action, you're ready, um, ready to do it. I would also encourage if you're in a university to connect with your university government relations professionals. Um, they like to know that you're there and that you're interested in advocating um, and, and that you would be willing to come to Washington perhaps to meet with your with your um, your congressional delegation. So get to know your government relations folks. See if there's a way that you can fit in to their strategy of communicating with the Congress. Um, and then consider joining other groups as well. Um, the, the LSA may be your your sort of disciplinary home, but there are other groups out there as well, like COSA, like AAAS, um, who are more focused broadly on the science advocacy piece as their mission. Um, and so sign up for our materials um, that are free, um, COSA.org or other organizations as well, um, to make sure that if you're interested in advocacy, you have the resources to do it. And then here's just a menu of other um, ways that you could take action, whether it's a small step, a big step, a medium set, something in between, things that you can do, everything from um, signing up to get email updates from your member of Congress 
So you can find those touch points. You can find what interests them in ways you might engage. Um, you could send a tailored letter to the Hill. That's a medium step. Or you could make the trip to DC. I would encourage you to do that. Um, all of these other slides here are just examples of the resources that you can take advantage of free of charge as an LSA member or as um, you know, just a, a citizen of the of the world. You can go to the COSA website um, and find resources like, like this that you can easily pull down. We wanna make it as easy as possible for you to engage um, on behalf of your science and on behalf of the scientific community um, more broadly. And so with that, I think we're going to transition into the role play portion. Um, let me get our webcam. There we go. Um, and then I think after that, we will open it up for discussion. Great. Yes, thanks. And I uh, just wanted to remind you, uh, for this role play part of the webinar, you may want to um, begin the uh, camera that has Alice and, and Wendy on it. So you can just hover over that with your mouse, and you'll see a, a pair of arrows that says enlarge to make that happen. So Wendy and I are going to do our best to fit both of ourselves onto the screen. Um, and so uh, as we said, I'm going to play the constituent and Wendy's going to play the congressional staffer. So um, good afternoon, Wendy. I'm Hi Allison there. Reed. I'm Allison. the executive director of the Linguistic Society of America. Thank you for meeting with me today. Welcome. Always happy to meet with a constituent. Thank you for making the trip. I really appreciate it. What can I do for you today? Well, first, I wanted to make sure I gave you this information about the work that our members are doing in your district ah. and also give you a business card in case you ever need to get in touch with me about anything that I um, shared with you today. Um, so uh, we have linguists working at the university mm -hmm. in your district, and they're doing important research in a number of areas that have important implications for national security, for economic wow. competitiveness, and for education and human well-being. Um, oh, so it, you might know that my boss sits um, on the education committee. And so I'm very interested in giving my boss anything that he can use help make the case between science and education or language and STEM. Is there something happening in the district um, at the university as it relates to my members' individual interests? Absolutely. So uh, we have linguists uh, who are working in their lab at the university on uh, language acquisition among uh, early children, not early children, but among young children, mm -hmm. and how they can most effectively uh, master English as a second oh. language uh, because we have a lot of uh, people moving into the district who don't have English as their first language and we want to make sure yes. they can succeed educationally and so linguists are looking into developing uh, teaching uh, methodologies and strategies that uh, primary educators can use to help these students mass, master English as quickly as possible. That and would be fantastic. I'm sure they'd be delighted to share the specific results of their research with you. But it's important to understand, too, that they're building on decades of basic research that has been oh. supported by the National Science Foundation and other federal agencies. We don't always know, going into basic research, what our findings are going to be. They're foundational in nature, and so they allow our members uh, over the years to build on the discoveries of their predecessors and apply them in education settings, mm. in um, foreign relations settings, in um, technological settings. So, for example, linguistic research was uh, key in developing search engine technology artificial intelligence, machine translation, wow. which our intelligence community uses on a daily basis, Wow! Um, but also which businesses like Google and Microsoft have used to um, vastly expand our gross domestic product and our uh, ability to communicate with each other around the world. So that's exactly what my boss needs. I need tangible examples. Local would be great if you have them. But even some of these larger stories about um, uh, basic research and how it has sort of revolutionized our world today, um, because I feel like my boss understands that and I understand that, but I have a hard time articulating to colleagues who are looking to cut budgets um, how to make that case. And so I would love to be able to use you as a resource if you can help me get 
to um, these other scholars in the state, especially the, the local scholars. Um, but if you have, in addition to this awesome policy brief here, um, anything local you can send me as well as um, any information about what your top ask would be um, in this for funding or, or otherwise, because there are so many demands right now. Absolutely. We want you to make it as easy as possible. Absolutely. So I'll connect you with some of our local linguists that are working on these issues in your district. But I also want to make it very clear that what we're looking for is level funding for the National Science Foundation with no disproportionate cuts okay. to the linguistic programs that are housed within the Social Sciences Directorate. And right. we're also looking for restored funding for the National Endowment for the Humanities because the Trump administration has proposed the complete elimination of that agency. And again, it's that basic foundational research that has been funded over the past 50 to 75 years mm -hmm. that linguists are applying in your district to help students learn and master awesome. their education programs. I appreciate it. And um, I hope that you will knowing that we're very busy here, I'm hoping that you will stay in touch with me. If Absolutely. you don't hear from me, it doesn't mean that I'm not thinking about the work that's happening at the university, but please do find ways to stay in touch with me and we'll share resources. That's great. If I could have your card, I'll make sure you get what Absolutely. you need. Absolutely. Thank you for coming in. You're welcome, Wendy. Take care. Okay, thank you very much, Allison and Wendy. Um, we now come to the question and answer portion of the, uh, the webinar, so again, you have a questions widget in your GoToWebinar dashboard, and you can use that to ask the questions. And please indicate if they are um, for Wendy, for Allison, or for either one. And uh, we, we do have one question already. How can undergraduate students get involved with linguistic advocacy and social justice? Are there any specific programs, internships, workshops, et cetera, you, that you recommend? Well, I think on the, the social justice side of things, um, we recently issued an alert about a linguist, uh, language activist in Tibet who's in jail. And um, we're looking for linguists to contact the uh, Chinese Minister of Justice to demand his release. Um, he has already been tried, but he has not been sentenced um, and the verdict has not been reached. Um, so that's one example. Um, and uh, we work in concert with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, they have a science and human rights coalition that we are a member of, and we're represented on that coalition, not only by myself, but also by Michelle DeGroff, who's a linguist at MIT and has been doing a lot of work around social justice issues in Haiti and making sure that children there are able to learn STEM subjects in their native Haitian Creole as opposed to French, which most of them do not understand and cannot speak fluently. Um, so that's just one example. And so you might um, explore um, getting involved in the coalition's work. Um, there are local chapters of Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch um, at many campuses. Um, and the intersection between language and human rights is manifold. Um, 2019 will be the uh, UN uh, International Year of Indigenous Languages, and the LSA is very interested in developing a series of um, programs and resources on that topic, um, and we can use all the help we can get um, from undergraduates or um, anyone else who's interested in that. Um, I think this whole issue of criminal justice and linguistic access um, is is uh, very localized, so it's it's quite uh, possible that um, you know the district attorney's office and other. Um, elements of the criminal justice system in your community that might be a police department um, are completely unaware of these issues around linguistic discrimination. You could organize some kind of program um, that you would invite those people to attend to learn more about it. Um, you could promote John Rickford's presidential address that um, dealt with that. It's available on YouTube. Um, 
so those are just two examples. Um, and uh, with more time, I could probably come up with some others. Um, but uh, I think that there are a lot of connections between uh, language and social justice. Again, the immigration ban and you know contacting your elected officials about that and how it limits scholarly exchange. Um, not only uh, for you as a linguistic student, but for uh, your fellow students who may be coming from other parts of the world and are interested in being here to pursue their studies and to collaborate with other scholars uh, around their research. Wendy? Yeah, I, I would add that from where I sit, and, and I bring lots of people to the Hill um, to advocate, students make the best advocates. Not only are they, they energetic, um, as you seem to be, um, they are very well received by policymakers, and they are in fact seen as the future. Um, and they're seen as investments, you know, local investments from their state. They want everyone, uh, all the students and all the young people, to turn into great contributors um, to the state and to society. And so, I would encourage all students to get in, engaged, whatever that means for you. So um, if you're a member of the LSA um, and you want to pull down the resources that they offer, um, that COSA offers, um, please do so. But in addition, what we're seeing in this environment is um, student groups being formed across the country in different um, around different issues. And some are even happening around different social science disciplines. So perhaps there is a language group um, that is not only sort of meeting to talk about scholarship um, um, in the institute, in your university, um, but it could also be that there are ties to what can be done locally in terms of advocacy as well. We're seeing that in the anthropology community. We're seeing sort of student groups being formed across the country. Um, so I would encourage you to just get involved in some way, because I think we're at a bit of a um, a pivot point where we're going to see a lot more action by um, especially undergraduate students in advocacy and especially science advocacy. The other point I'll make very briefly is the beauty of being an undergraduate is you have one foot in one congressional district and the other foot in a second congressional district unless your university is where you you know lived before you uh, attended it and so uh, frequently you can actually you know, contact more than one member of Congress and more than your two senators and have complete legitimacy as being familiar with both um, your home base and your university base. So um, don't be shy about doing that. They don't, they're not going to know where you're registered to vote. Um, and you absolutely should be registered to vote if you're not. So that's vote. step one. Yes, vote. All right. Thanks. Here's another question. And it's for either one of you. I've heard that official official English legislation is potentially coming back. Is this something on your radar and do you have any recommendations for us? Yes, it's something that we monitor. So we uh, monitor uh, news alerts um, on a daily basis on anything related to language policy, anything related to uh, linguistic research. Um, and we know about these things as, as early as they're reported on. Um, we don't use like a state legislative tracking service. Um, we can't afford it, quite honestly. Um, but there are other uh, partners of ours who do. So the American Council for the Teaching of Foreign Languages and the Joint National Committee on Language both um, you know, monitor state policy developments. And so if we became aware of something that was being proposed at the state level on that topic, we would absolutely send an alert um, segmented to our members in that state and encourage them to get involved with the other folks in that state that are active on that issue. And that might be an immigration group. It might be a group of language teachers at the K-12 12 level. but um, And that's the beauty of um, the LSA being a member of these larger organizations and having partners and allies in DC that have more resources, frankly, than we do with just our three staff um, to keep an eye on all of these things. But that's definitely uh, an issue that comes back um, and rears its ugly head uh, on a frequent basis. But we're not aware of um, any recent legislation that's actually been enacted and, and signed into law. And that's an important distinction too. Um, something like 10% of bills that are introduced actually become law. There's just so much that is done, at least at the federal level, state is different. 
Um, there's so much that's done at the federal level that's really just messaging, messaging bills or messaging activities. It's a way to just sort of make a statement on something. It doesn't mean it's going to turn into a new law or a new regulation. And that's why groups like mine, um, the LSA, the AAAS, others exist is to help um, uh, distinguish when the threats are real and when they're not. And so if you're getting uh, an action alert from the LSA, um, it's because there's some real threat out there and your action is needed. Okay, and here's another question. Uh, the, the, the questioner is, is wondering whether youth linguistics is perhaps uniquely vulnerable because it uh, hovers between the traditional humanities and the science disciplines. And, uh, and since there, there are devastating cuts both to science and to end of humanities. Uh, so what's, what's your take on that? I don't think it's uniquely vulnerable because of that. Um, there are certainly other fields um, that straddle that uh, bridge or you know cross that bridge. So communication, science, um, anthropology. Um, uh, we have a lot of colleagues that are you know bo both involved with the National Humanities Alliance and with COSA. Um, so we have some common cause with those people. I do think that. You know, NEH, as I said earlier, is much more vulnerable than anything with the word science in it. Um, you know, there's much more credence given to STEM as a meaningful career path where you can earn a living, um, even if the data don't necessarily support a strong distinction between science and humanities in terms of outcomes for people's earnings and careers. But you have a lot of um, received wisdom, um, which is faulty, about the value of humanities degree versus the value of a STEM degree and the importance of STEM education at the earliest age and STEM, 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 STEM. So I do think that um, it's important that we always talk about linguistics as the scientific study of language, that we use the phrase language science interchangeably with linguistics so people know that they are one and the same thing. Um, but that we not, you know, throw humanities under the bus in um, some rush to label ourselves as a science. Um, so I would embrace um, the humanistic side of um, linguistics uh, when it's appropriate. And, you know, depending on your audience, um, you know, tailor your message around their interests. So, you know, Wendy's um, congressional staffer was interested in education. Um, and so I focused on that. Mm -hmm. And I would say, um, <clears throat> you know, we see we see attacks on individual disciplines from time to time, um, but it's usually done through picking on one individual grant that a policymaker doesn't think is in the quote unquote national interest. Um, and so where we see a lot of individual attacks on social science research is when dealing with other cultures, populations outside the U.S., um, languages that you know, are um, endangered or obscure or, um, you know, the, the DEL program can be a, a target because it, it, you got policymakers wondering why do we need to study these languages that may not be used anymore? Why do we need to document them? Um, but again, that's not usually a wholesale attack on linguistics. It's, it's using one example as a case for why you know funding for social science is or or the humanities are wasteful or something so i don't think your good news is i don't think linguistics is um worse off <laughs> than many of the other social science disciplines because of the straddling of social science um, and the humanities i think we all share very common challenges okay thanks and i think we have room for just one more uh, quick question so um it was obvious during the role play that Wendy was not uh, the member of Congress. Can you talk a little more about who exactly she was? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and uh, I should have said during during my presentation that um, you could meet with the member of Congress, you could meet with the staffer. I personally think that you have um, a better meeting when you're meeting with the staffer. So in this example, um, I, envision that I was a young staffer um, in a personal office of a member of Congress. Um, and so uh, in, a, in a congressional office, there are a bunch of very young, capable, smart people who are meant to be multitaskers every single day. 
So the person um, that I was representing likely um, was responsible for the members' responsibilities on education, because I talked about the education committee. I may also be the person responsible for immigration, science more broadly, perhaps housing. It's not unusual for individual staffers to have to wear five, six, 10 hats um, and deal with the member of Congress's uh, responsibilities, committee responsibilities, writing legislation, writing speeches on whatever issue is within that person's portfolio. That being said, it may seem really hard to um, affect change um, when you're speaking to someone like that who doesn't seem to be able to focus all that much on one issue only. Their job is to distill what you're saying to them and to give it to their boss. They have direct access to the member of Congress in most cases. Um, and so going back to my earlier points about making your message as clear and relatable and short as possible will help that staffer who's very busy um, and may have 10 more meetings right after you um, to take that message to their boss and translate it into something actionable. Anything to add? I was just going to say mechanistically that when you call to request the appointment, they're going to ask you, you know, who you are, what what you're interested in talking about. And if you say, you know, linguistics funding within the National Science Foundation or the National Endowment for the Humanities or whatever, they're going to pair you with the staff person that has that portfolio. Um, and, you know, Scheduling may conspire that when you show up, that person's not available for whatever reason, but that's generally how it works. And if you're trying to meet with a congressional staffer in the home district um, where you live, um, don't be surprised if when they t when they find out you want to talk about policy and funding that they t tell you to talk to the congressional staffers in, in D.C., I would say don't take that for an answer. Say you really want to come in and get to know them and talk about the work you're doing in the district and showcase that for them. Mm -hmm. um, so that, those are two strategies for um, dealing with uh, staff members. OK, thanks. We're, uh, we're just about out of time now. So thank you very much, um, Allison and Wendy, for taking time out of your schedules to share your, uh, your experience with us. And uh, thank you everyone who took the time to attend the webinar. We'll have a recording of it available uh, fairly soon on the LSA's YouTube channel, and we'll send you an email to let you know when that happens. Have a good rest of the, uh, the afternoon and a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye now. Thanks, thank David.